Okay, so let's get going. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Marcus Miller. I'm the director of here at the Snell Grove Gallery. Uh, and I'm very happy to be introducing uh, the second in a series of our uh, MFA talks here. Last week we had uh, George Dingris, and uh, we thought that we'd have a bodybuilder here today as well, because we thought that was, you know, the new way we are going to be doing artist talks, but unfortunately we're going to be disappointed here. <laughs> but I'm really happy to introduce uh, Risa Gundesen. Uh, I first met uh, Risa in uh, Lethbridge when she was having a show at the Trianon Gallery in downstairs in the grotto. And, and it was an appropriate place for you to be showing those paintings because they were, they were sort of lifted from uh, the internet and there were all kinds of images of uh, 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 people uh, uh, that had bodily modifications. And, uh, um, and, and Risa, I think, was sort of interested in, well, the statement from that show, I'll, I'll just give you a few lines from it. The politics of desirability of the body, the possessive gaze, and she was uh, uh, using what she called low imagery uh, so as to reposition it in a medium of traditional high imagery, oil painting. And I think she told me at the time that uh, you know she was uh, planning on uh, uh, applying here. I don't know if you already applied to U of S at that point. I was, I was already in at that point. That would have been September of uh, 2016. So yeah, it was it was like right when I had just started. So I asked you, you know, why what, why were you interested in coming to the U.S. and in this art program in particular? And Risa said that she wanted to learn how to paint, and so that's one of the great strengths of this department, obviously. Um, uh, she also went on to uh, say that her practice deals also with self-portraiture, and you'll certainly see some of that here. Uh, um, that's a female, female artist representing my own body. She writes, the culturally implied binary of artist views, male, female, is subverted or at least skirted. And in this way, is it possible, she asks, to invoke an alternate oppositional gaze? I don't think I'm going to say very much more, except that I did sort of check Risa out on an academic social network site where she says that she was a specialist in photography. So we're all going to expect these photos to be excellent. <laughs> uh, she also, from her Facebook page, uh, I know that she likes Spanish soap operas. Elevator, the band, blind assassin, and survival of the soul. Recess. Wow. Just, just blindsided by that intro there. I, and I think when I was talking to you at that opening, Marcus, like everyone there had brought me a drink. So I remember very little of that conversation. Class, I made a good impression. Goodness. Goodness. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm in my uh, second year of my MFA now. I'm hoping to uh, to defend and conclude my degree in September, sometime in September, I believe. Um, yeah, like Marcus was saying, I came into the program um, with an interest in uh, the politics of the gaze, in the viewer view dichotomy, um, and kind of how art historical, Western art historical context and the contemporary overlap. Um, I sort of started in on my current work that deals a lot with self-portraiture last year when I was uh, doing these selfie prints. Um, so I was, I was interested in uh, what is sort of derisively termed selfie culture um, as this uh, often really overtly feminine space where um, an apparent majority of the, of the users are, are young, female-identified people. Um, and it seems like it can function as this space for displaying successful gender performances. And I thought that's sort of an interesting idea. 
and of course there's there's this very um, you know very prevalent kind of anger towards that sort of idea of selfie culture and I think it, it kind of parallels the older uh, sort of narcissism vanity hypocrisy where uh, women are told the most valuable thing to be is beautiful and then criticized for, for showcasing sort of the, the labor they put into that. Um, John Berger in, in Ways of Seeing talks about the, the trope in, in history painting of um, the, the beautiful young woman looking in the mirror. So he says, the mirror was often used as a symbol of the vanity of women. The moralizing, however, was mostly hypocritical. You painted a naked woman because you enjoyed looking at her. You put a mirror in her hand and you called the painting vanity, thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you had depicted for your own pleasure. Um, also uh, sort of interesting to me um, within the purview of selfie culture uh, was the idea of um, interior spaces as they are documented in like uh, in selfies and lifestyle blogs, YouTube tutorials, blogs, all that sort of thing. So bedrooms, bathrooms, living spaces, um, interior spaces are already kind of uh, you know traditionally coded like the home is coded as female, and through kind of these social media experiences, it seems to become further integrated into an extension of the body and an extension of this performance. So I got into that a bit more um, once I sort of moved this trope into, into uh, painting. With the prints, I, I was mostly just thinking about parallels of visual politics in the contemporary versus the historical and just kind of recontextualizing by bringing the contemporary into historical mediums. And of course, um, self-portraiture, uh, which is very central to uh, the contemporary visual culture. And it's also very significant uh, for its impact on that viewer-viewed uh, dichotomy. So then, yeah, I moved, uh, I kind of moved this, this trope into oil painting, which is my primary medium there. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this painting in just a sec. I want to get a, a little bit into, into some theory stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the, in the concept of boundaries. Um, uh, theorist Linda Need talks about ideas of margins and boundaries um, as they relate to the nude in, in Western art history, in, in, allegor in allegorical painting. Um, she, she talks about the, the very sort of Kantian concepts of these boundaries in art and beauty. So uh, Kant says, the beautiful in nature is a question of the form of the object, and this consists of limitation. So Need talks about those, uh, those boundaries in terms of the transformation of the naked woman into the nude. Um, so where the woman is unstable and threatening and her body is a, a marginal, permeable space, it's an entrance, it's an exit, it's, it can be the site of conception, birth, menstruation, and all these sorts of things. So the nude then is whole and inviolate. It is the sieve through which no water passes. Um, as an object, the nude is available, reassuring, and affirming of the supremacy of the patriarchal gaze. Uh, the nude stands for that control. Uh, because the nude has been contained, it stands for the containment of something threatening. Mead says, the female nude is a sign of those other more hidden properties of patriarchal culture, that is possession, power, and subordination. So transformed in this way, constrained by these boundaries, the nude is no longer herself. She can only be beautiful, she can only be the symbol. Um, from John Berger again, to be naked is to be oneself. To be nude is to be seen naked by others and yet not recognized by oneself, for oneself. A naked body has to be seen as an object in order to become a nude. 
So next in, in my kind of uh, train of thought there is um, the idea of then transgressing those margins. And as you can uh, probably see from, from this painting, I became interested in ideas of revulsion and uh, objection. Um, and yeah, and in, in feelings of disgust. Um, Michelle Meager posits a relationship between sociocultural taboos and emotions of disgust as they relate to bodily integrity. So uh, fluids and substances which may breach bodily boundaries, um, you know, blood, urine, feces, saliva, whatever, are acceptable when they're contained within the body and they remain acceptable as long as they're re-enclosed by an appropriate margin upon escaping. But if these substances are uncontained, they become threatening and disgusting. Um, even hair, which uh, when it's on your head, it, it can be familiar or beautiful. As soon as it uh, falls off your head, you don't want it touching you. You see a lump of hair on the floor, even if you know it's your own hair, that's gross, you don't want to touch it, right? So. Meager extends this phenomena into the social and cultural, explaining those things that cannot be controlled, those things that refuse to be bounded, are anomalies that cause profound cultural anxiety. In systems ordered by structures of pollution, things that are out of place are dangerous. So my interest in, in the object uh, it, it's mostly to do with with a, a deliberate kind of disobedience through um, through objection, and what I I'm thinking about is the possibilities of a kind of inverted performance. So uh, with this painting, as you can see, um, I'm uh, considering. Um, well, so the first thing I was considering, we'll go to a bit of an earlier version of this painting, so you can kind of see where I was starting. Um, considering the, the uh, possibilities of, of the paint as skin, um, when you hear uh, critics talk about, like, uh, Lucian Freud or Jenny Seville, for example, they talk a lot about their use of the paint as, like, an almost literal flesh or skin. So I was interested in the possibilities of the paint uh, as scarification, as growth, as decay, as these type of things that are quite literally transgressing margins of the body, while at the same time keeping that, that materiality uh, kind of couched in the body, <coughs> because I feel like that, that close tie to, to the bodily um, elicits these emotions of, of revulsion, of disgust, of uh, perhaps empathy or, or fellow feeling there. And uh, so yeah, I, I started kind of just like really piling the paint on, like, so in, so a bit kind of like a scarification thing here, in here was really just kind of piling the paint on in, in layers and then I started sort of peeling it back a bit to reveal underpaintings. And uh, later on, I'd get into some, some different like cold wax mediums and things to really up that uh, textural potential, but really just sort of putting it on, peeling it off, and really working it. Um, so, um, I, and so, um, in this way, I, I'm sort of addressing, um, well, I'm addressing a few things, but one of them is that, uh, you know, the one-way kind of mirror of the viewer-viewed relationship where the, the viewer looks and the uh, subject of the painting is in turn looked at. Um, I think in, in uh, breaking down that reflective, contemplative one-way look by eliciting um, disgust, or sympathy or sort of fellow feeling within the body. The idea is that the viewer should become aware of their own body. By looking at this body, they become aware of their own in return um, through, through whatever type of, of feeling it makes them feel. And it, it you know, pushes back through that gaze. 
And of course, self-portraiture um, exacerbates that by confusing the, the artist-muse relationship, which is, of course, closely tied to that viewer-viewed situation. And it removes that convenient kind of inroad, that convenient surrogacy for the viewer. Um, and then, of course, also I'm to, to talk about, again, these interior spaces, I'm uh, dealing with, with my own living space. The, my original intention with these, um, because the, the reference photos were all taken in my own bedroom, the original intention was to set up a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, I've lost the word, but just to, you know, set up a, a nice sort of area that I could take the, um, the images in, but then I decided to just take them with the room being as it was in that moment. And that then, um, and then extending that, um, that abject performance and extending the, the body into this space. So it all, and it's integrating uh, again in that way. So and that's kind of the second one I did with that concept. And um, yeah, so, so the idea of these interior spaces as, as an extension of the body and of that performance. And then um, the other thing kind of in this bent that I've been doing recently is these uh, kind of extreme close-ups of, of my face where I'm uh, you know, pulling it with my fingers and making it into this uh, sort of creepy mask-like situation. And, um, and uh, of course, the, the kind of explicit reference to self-portraiture with the camera isn't so much there. But um, you'll notice like in the, in the eyes and in, in some of the other ones, just like the way I deal with the highlights, I want to continue to reference um, that uh, photographic uh, source um, fairly explicitly. Um, so something recently that I've sort of been thinking about more is um, the, the entropic nature of using abjection as this form of disobedience. So this, this desire that I feel to, to disobey, to, to, um, to spite um, objectifying forces by making myself or my image into something repugnant or monstrous or awful. Um, the idea that this is, that, that disobedience is self-destructive in nature, which I, I think is sort of an interesting concept to deal with. Um, a bit of a close-up, you can see a bit better what's kind of going on there with the, with the texture and so on. And so the, the other interesting thing I find there is the, um, the tension between that desire to, to disobey in this way, in this kind of self-destructive way, the tension between that and the pleasure of successful gendered performances. Because of course, you know, when you, you look nice, you put effort into that, somebody tells you you look nice, that feels good uh, in most situations. And so that pleasure versus this other uh, desire to sort of spite that, um, that expectation of performance, I think the tension there is something quite interesting to think about. Um, and it sort of plays out formally in what I'm doing in terms of these areas of very uh, painterly, um, figurative, almost sort of impressionistic uh, types of painting that is then disrupted by these areas that kind of uh, descend into objection and disgust or just dissolve into something more abstract. With these, um, with the, the close-ups of the face, I've also kind of been messing around with, with color and ways that can also disrupt and, and create more abstract spaces within there, kind of in the underpainting. Here's, 
Here's like an early version of, of the one I'm currently working on. So you can see I'm like using a lot of not terribly naturalistic color in the enter painting, and then that kind of plays out here. Um, and, and so with that idea of that tension, it also, I find, mirrors my experiences of um, anxiety and mental illness in terms of um, the, the necessity for, for a really keeping really a tight rein on things and that ever-present kind of risk of the, of the loss of control of things spiraling and you know, getting bad. And the, the kind of textured areas in the paintings, um, they, they sort of in my head, they really mimic um, compulsive behaviors I've experienced of skin picking and peeling and really just working away at, at, at one spot in a way that is self-destructive, but it's also soothing, right? These behaviors are soothing. So uh, the idea of destroying the body as being in some way therapeutic, I think is something very interesting to explore. So that's, um, that's kind of where I'm at at this point. Um, uh, for, my, for my show in September, I, I'm gonna continue dealing with similar things, just kind of more paintings. Um, the, I'm, I'm interested in maybe doing some work with uh, like the, the, the boudoir kind of tropes, so like bathrooms. Um, I'm also, I've been working on just kind of in my TV time at night, some, some pastel miniatures of uh, the rotting food that gets left in my fridge. Um, I have some just sort of beginning Oh, there's a, another close-up of this. There's some like beginning um, of those. This is probably the best one for sort of seeing what's going on there. So I was working a bit with that. I'm, I'm thinking of also blowing these up into, into large-scale paintings, uh, kind of in the same style as I've been working with the figurative stuff. Um, from a conceptual standpoint, I think it, it works in terms of uh, what I'm talking about in terms of interior spaces as extensions of the body and extensions of, of performances because it is uh, from my own house in that way. And of course it also ties in with uh, both um, uh, a lot of the sort of traditional Western art painting references I'm talking about in terms of still lives and, and um, contemporary uh, uh, social media culture, taking pictures of food and things like that. And just formally, I think it, uh, the rotting food works quite well with uh, the way I've been treating the, the figures and so on. So that's sort of where I'm, where I'm going from there. And um, yeah, that's, that's about it. I, I don't, was that very fast? I know I speed up when I'm nervous, that's what I'm saying. Well paced. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so kind of an obvious question that I think you skirt a lot in all of your figures and in your vegetative uh, landscapes in a sense, uh, there's a lot of decay and that always makes me think of mortality. Um, how much is that a part of your thinking process when you're working on them? Because it's always implied if it's not, you know, pointed out. I mean, I think it's um, it ties in insofar as uh, the the sort of things I'm talking about in terms of, of gender and so on. Um, those, you know, that's very tied to youth and beauty. So decay kind of being the opposite of that. Um, I don't know if I'm addressing sort of mortality. Or, or I'm not thinking about addressing mortality really head on, but I do think that sort of um, death and the maiden kind of motif kind of works itself in there, I would it's, say. It's an interesting it subtext, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, particularly in these newer works of, uh, of the rotting vegetables in your fridge, you know, to me, they fit into those kind of Dutch still lifes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so I'm a little conflicted about the, the pa pastels, to be honest, because they're, like, I think I can make some, you know, very, very beautiful photorealistic 
uh, works with the pastel, but it's it's not a medium I've worked with terribly recently, so I'm almost not sure what to do with it to, to just mix things up a bit, which is why I think I am going to be bringing these into paintings, because I just have a much better sort of feeling of what to do with paint and how to, to work with it in a way that I find interesting. There's, there's another thing I was noticing, you know, we don't always get the kind of view you work in progress, and there's a certain stage in some of the paintings before they're kind of mm -hmm. fully realized and they're developing kind of three-dimensionality, where they're a little bit flatter. And your use of color is almost Matisse-like. You have kind of, you know, a very kind of bold kind of teal blue stripe going across, or, or even yeah. these ones here. Uh, so you're thinking a lot about color, too. <laughs> I, I treat, I, I guess what I'm doing is I'm allowing myself to be a bit freer with color than I used to be. I, I treat color as in a pretty sort of instinctual way, like I, you know, I've got all the paints sitting there and I just kind of go with it occasionally, like I've, I've had a bunch of uh, Williamsburg samples sitting on my, um, sitting on my palette there and I, uh, the, the color's not great in the in the photo here, but like the um, this area here, that's like a straight Persian rose right out of the tube. So I've been just kind of dealing it with it in a fairly just instinctual way, just sort of seeing what works. If I don't like it, I'll get rid of it and just sort of letting it happen, which is perhaps a Matisse-like approach to yeah. color, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking of it further back where you have, I think in the boudoir painting where you're kind of, or you're on the bed painting where you're just mm -hmm. painting against the bed with that kind of big blue teal stripe. Mm -hmm. And then you have another color here, or kind of a yellow background. Mm -hmm. And it could be right out of Matisse, even the kind of red leg it's like a Matisse's painting of his wife with a woman with green nose. So there's a really wonderful kind of contradiction going on in your work between the thematic content that you address in terms of theory and then how you work with paint and the kind of visual felt weight uh, of how you kind of move the eye around that rectangle. And it's a nice tension for me. I think it really works. And I think it adds to the subject matter you're looking at, but it just kind of takes it outside itself. And I don't know if it's because I've just been to the dentist today, but when you, especially when you start zooming in and you had those close-ups, I really found it really exacerbated the objectivity that you're bringing into your work. And it, it just brought me, drew me into it even when I was feeling, actually feeling it in my body. But as I said, I've just been to the dentist. And it's I, I think I think teeth are, are good yeah. for that. People feel like very strongly about teeth and what's. It's, it is a, a very sort of visceral thing. So I think, yeah, the, the close-ups are good for that because mouths and teeth, there's a lot of stuff going on there in terms of our association. And the way you've handled all of those, you know, as you say, yeah, the yicky sort of things <laughs> happening, just absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, teeth, they're often checked for health, right? Mm -hmm. See how old the horses are out to you. I, I find it interesting that the kind of battle, and I'm curious uh, about something, and that's the way that you use the, the, the I, I like the way you spoke about the canvas as being sort of almost like a symbolic body, an extension of that, the picking at it, the, the building up on the surface, the scab-like quality, and the way that it, it um, you know, you're removing stuff and adding stuff and covering stuff, and I, I find that very interesting. and. I, I was looking, as I'm watching the, the progression of some of these paintings, what I'm very uh, um, in touch with is the level of competence and the high skill that you have. And I think that there's something really interesting about that because you also don't paint something that becomes beautiful. It, it, it is sort of beautiful, but, but it's more the repulsive side. So you turn that um, capability into something that pushes somebody away from accepting it only as that. And um, so I think just the handling becomes very uh, connected to the things that you talked about earlier, which I'm, I'm really enjoying. So the deliberate um, destruction of beauty through the work is quite interesting. And then I, I, I'm wondering, because it's less personal, what will happen with the fruit? Because magnifying one's own body and having that kind of personal connection to, I don't know, makeup and, and all of the kinds of, you know, things that happen with the body, blisters, sores, all of those things. On a fruit, it's very different because it's very voyeuristic. So I guess my, sorry, long-winded question would be, 
you know, how do you, since your work is a battle with self, what happens when there's a vehicle for that? Um, I mean, I guess, so with the fruit, I'm, I'm still sort of working some stuff out. I think I will try and do a big painting just to see how it goes and see how I feel about it. Um, I, I, I am, I'm sort of thinking, like I said, along the lines of these things in my space and thinking of those as an extension of the body and so I'm going to try it out and see how well it plays out and of course it will be in the context in terms of the show it will be in the context of all these other figures so yeah I'm, I'm sort of feeling my way through that and seeing how how it's how it's going to work um, I think there's in that context there's maybe some nice metaphorical stuff going on there Just following up on uh, what Ellie was asking, in that you mentioned the tension was really important to you between um, the kind of uh, desire to disobey and disrupt um, the way that the body, particularly the female body or your own body, can be viewed, and then the pleasure of uh, perhaps what you call a successful gendered performance. And so that tension is so obvious in the <coughs> works that are figurative and self sort of referential. And I'm trying to imagine how that, if that kind of tension is really important to you, how that might carry forward into the work with the fruit. Like, what kind of tension is it? Yeah, I mean, formally, I think I can do a lot just in terms of having some very nice uh, figurative painterly areas versus other areas that are just, you know, flying towards uh, abstraction or objection. So I, I have a lot of sort of formal ideas about that, which is, and so I, I really do think I need to just make one painting and see how it works and see how I, I feel about what I'm, I'm trying to say there. But like I think you're both right. It's possible that it just won't read quite as quite as clearly, and that the intentionality won't be there so much. But I do find it interesting that you are picking that you're looking at that because when you think about traditionally, you know, when people were doing aesthetically beautiful still lives, again, the fruit had uh, who was it? Cezanne was using fake fruit and stuff mm -hmm. because he didn't want it to decay. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're deliberately taking the the ugly. The, the, you know, which can be beautiful too in some respects, but the fact that you're also um, taking that subject on is interesting too to me because it seems like it's exactly what you're doing with your, you know, mm -hmm. with your... I think there's, um, there's some references there, like if it can be made clear through a title or through sort of the area surrounding the, the objects that it's like inside a home, inside a kitchen, kitchen I think there's possible.